Hey, there we go. Hi, Ricky. Hey, I just, I maybe invented, is delimitation a word? I don't, I don't think that's a word. Yeah, I don't know. Delimiting, del, 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 yeah. I don't know. Hello. <laughs> hey. Hey, long time no see. Yeah. How are you doing? Good. Good, good. Um, How are you doing? Also doing well. It's uh, quite warm here now, which it usually wasn't since I came back from the US. Yeah, are you in uh, Berlin? Yeah, so it must be nice down there in Bayern. Yeah, it's, it's a little chilly here. <laughs> I, Not too bad, but there's- like... I mean, I'm in Berlin. <laughs> Bayern is for uh, Thomas. Oh, you you live in Berlin. I thought you were in Munich, okay. Oh. Thomas lives in Munich. I live in Berlin. I live in Prenzlauer okay. Berg. Good evening. Oh, okay. Hey. Yeah, you yeah. have a, All right. <laughs> a really nice t-shirt. Yeah. Chose the right one for, uh. the, for the day, <laughs> obviously. Yes, this will be a very graphical experience. Viewers be warned. <laughs> Get it? It's going to look really cool. Yeah. I'm quickly creating a Google Doc where we can take some uh, collaborative notes. Uh, yeah, so I'll just make that um, editable for the world. There we go. I will send it in Zoom. Hey, um, we don't have any agenda. <laughs> so, well. So we, that's it for today. Thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, do we want to review anything? Does anyone have any proposals or new cool ideas to talk about? Um, yeah, we can quickly um, create an agenda together. Um, feel free to go into the document and suggest things. I send it in Zoom. Let's agree on that and then we can dive into things. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sounds good. <laughs> there we go. Yep. Yeah, and I got some notes here specifically about um, oops, I'm not, yeah about the prototype, um, <clears throat> the plan the, the the plan for validating and testing and how we get people involved, um, what iterations are going to look like. Um, there's still um, design needs to address just in the like the very fundamental current version of it without it being iterated on there's just design needs that have to happen um i'm still not i haven't heard back from julian um since you asked him to have a look tim that was a few weeks ago but prior to that he and i um tried to get him to explain the alpha colors thing to me and i still don't get it so i um, my, oh, okay. we, we can get into it, but my primary concern is just about extensibility, like people writing their own themes and how that, how the alpha value situation is working. Um, so I want to, um, add that to the agenda as well. Okay. Good. Please. Uh, I think that for the next, uh, one, I should actually invite Julian. <laughs> uh, we used to have him even in one, uh, a few months ago. It's crazy. It's already July. I think that Ricky, we talked, I think in June, uh, uh, January, uh, about uh, potentially having a new design one day. And now we're here having an implementation nearly done. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Indeed. And yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. How, how much uh, things have changed in such a good way uh, so quickly. 
uh man yeah i mean i'm happy for it yeah any anything else anyone would like to talk about um i i was gonna talk about i was gonna bring up a doc site for the mono repo in general but i think it's maybe like there's still some things to solidify for 2.0 before we even need to worry about docs <laughs> obviously uh so but then eventually we'll have like I'd love to help with docs for graphical react and of course graphical itself. And, uh, maybe I, I, I guess what I'm getting at is a doc site. So if we want to talk about a doc site, I don't know if we, if it's okay to treat this working group as a mono repo working group, or is it just a graphical and, uh, react component? You know, that's a, a question, but, um, I would probably keep it in the beginning of the call in graphical and React. Yeah, it's interesting okay. because in a sense, the monorepo <laughs> for sure is way more than just graphical. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that was Lee's decision to keep the repo named graphical. It was my idea to combine the everything into one uh, mono repo. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, but yeah, uh, it was, yeah. So it is a little... It's always yeah, confusing. There's a discrepancy between what the working group does or what we talk about and what uh, the repo in, uh, entails, right? But it's fine. We can deal with it. Uh, you uh, are muted. The most intense. Ah, oh, oh, wait. Back. No, uh, the most, just uh, internet. Oh, weird. <laughs> um, the, the most intensive work right now is going on in graphical, uh, like the, the end user product of graphical and so let's keep yeah we'll keep the working group focused on like product okay. working group basically and i'll trail on about doc site stuff maybe after you're done talking about graphical how about that okay <laughs> sounds good uh so then let's get started uh is the order good for everyone and then we should also normally in the official graph here uh working group we assign time and the speaker uh, so we can look out for it a bit. Let's quickly do that so we can watch for that because sometimes topics can get a bit large. Um, I mean, John's prototype, I would say John is the uh, yeah. expert on it. How, how long do you think we need to talk about it? Uh, let's do 15 minutes if that's fine. That sounds good. Uh, the whole path to Graphical 2, I think we can uh, just talk about it forever. Maybe we limit that to 30 minutes if we even need that. And then the, the doc side, uh, the Ricky, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, that works. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Maybe, maybe not even. My first question will be is when does, you know, the product graphical need a doc site, you know, mm -hmm. and that. Okay, good. So then let's get started. John, talking about your prototype. Yeah, How so I made, um, just over the last couple of days, I made some pretty, like there's no radical effect, but I made some big changes to the way that um, I'm deploying it. So previously it was running on ladle. Uh, the Just that root URL was um, all the components and everything and I, I really, it was just a sort of a first stab at like getting the thing on the screen and so people could play with it. But um, I've since taken what I've been calling just like the reference implementation of the prototype uh, and de deployed it just independently. So I updated the readme in the repository. And now when you go to that root GitHub pages URL, you just see the prototype. There's no, there's no ladle. So you want to run ladle and, and, and have the development environment and see all the bits and the pieces, you just get the repository locally and, and run it that way. Um, it obviously it makes a ton of sense. Like there's no reason for ladle to be exposed at that root UL, but it just, again, I was trying to like just go super fast. So um, I'll put all that information onto the Discord channel um, right after we're done here. Um, I don't know that there's anybody following this thing at all. So it, it's- I am. You know, well, I mean, I, I think there's a few people that are that are looking after it, but I don't think anybody's actually using the thing, right? Because we don't have a plan. Like, there's no plan for how we validate it. Um, the truth is that, like, the 
the prototype is a prototype. It, it, it's, it just shits the bed on massive schemas, right? Because the React components aren't um, oriented for performance. It just, it's, it's real quick. So um, we should probably find a way to formalize the validation plan. You know, if we had, I don't know, if half a dozen people that were willing to review like validation changes, like as they come out, like against their own schemas or even against the test schemas, right? We really just need people to-, to uh, Which validation uh, changes? Any of them. I mean, like validating the prototype, right? So for me- Oh, I, I see what you mean, yeah. I thought you yeah, meant GraphQL valid validation changes. I was no, like, no, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> just validating the experience. That's what I mean. Like, do, like if we had a user experience researcher here, this is work that they would be doing, right? Um, so it would be nice to get somebody that could run a program like that, but I think it's probably a stretch uh, unless anybody knows somebody that wants to sort of get that, <clears throat> get that work in their portfolio for an open source project. Um, but I, I guess really, you know, the cadence that I usually run for these sort of prototypes is uh, there's an initial design. We know that it's kind of full of holes. We know that, um, we we know that it's directionally really well done, but the, it just needs to get filled out. So you build the initial version of a prototype. You have a specific subset of people that are that are testing against it, right? And th that this could just be like 15 minutes of playing around and like conversationally describing their experience, so that we can find some clear misses that need to be done. And then it goes back into design. We fill the holes. Uh, we update the code base, and then we just sort of keep that cadence going. I don't know how quickly we're gonna be able to step that up if this, uh, everybody on the call probably knows if this were a private company, we would probably be doing this multiple times a day. Um, we're not in that situation right now. Um, I don't know that it's necessary for us to be moving at that sort of, at that kind of a clip. Um, but the, I, the I process would love I honestly, if anyone is watching these videos as they're recorded and uploaded, if your company would like to sponsor someone to help uh, Thomas review work and introduce, you know, PRs and help with design and whatever, um, like, please, uh, <laughs> because then things could, could, could maybe, uh, maybe we, that could help um, with a, 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 um, a balanced acceleration pace and also all review help is is welcome by anyone. If people, if anyone submits a review of these PRs, like I, it's useful feedback, probably. So, yeah. Yeah, probably not too many people are watching the recording, uh, but we should also, yeah, we, we can talk about that later. How, how we can, or we talk about it now. How we can involve the community here. Um, I saw. I think Ricky, you tweeted that right. That John. Uh, that there was the uh, prototype. Did we get any um, anyone actually looking into it? Uh, so far, no responses from the community. Oh, the oh the uh, there's lots of comments on the prototypes and people in discussion. But you know, it's uh, uh, oh. I don't know. I think some people did end up reviewing some PRs uh, and have shown some interest, you know, and are looking into things, but mostly just like cool looks nice you know like and that's yeah. that's like that's validation that's about uh, well, yeah. the, the prototype what that I... john worked on that got very uh, that both got... i mean i've there's been good feedback for both the prototype and for the deploy previews of tomas's work so yeah they, they, um, we need to make we need to make it clear to, to as as we begin to formalize what we're going to do here we need to make it clear to everybody that these are that these are separate things right yeah, we, yeah. we need to find a way to Maybe we just rename the prototype. We just come up with some dumb name and we just call it that, right? So that it's- Then people clear. might think it's a new thing. No, it's yeah, yeah it's true. just like a, oh, a low- My point, my point uh, yeah, stands. Like, yeah, yeah. Right, Proof of concept. To... Yeah, so one, one yes. thing that, one sort of initial stab at, um, get, at just advertising and getting people who have, just getting people sort of just a small, like again, like a handful, a half dozen people that are interested in paying some level of frequent attention to this was, I was just gonna go back to the, um, 
uh, Tim, to your discussion on GitHub, right, where a lot of this is starting. And I was just going to call all those people out and say, hey, because mm -hmm. there, there was a, early on, there was, you know, like a dozen people that were chiming in with really interesting thoughts and ideas. And that ended up being this collation of, I think, conversations that had happened on, right, like one graph has um, an issue on their repository that has like all kinds of great features and ideas and people came in from that. And so I was just going to just going to add all those people in a response um, in that discussion and, and just say, like, here's here's the plan. If anybody is willing to commit, you know, 20 minutes once a week or whatever, we decide the cadence is to sort of revalidating their ideas. That was my thoughts for just getting an initial group of people that have shown interest in the past. Right. Not just interest, but have strong opinions about a lot of these things. Um, I think that's great because I'm not sure how many people that are in that uh, discussion that's on GitHub are on the Discord and and paying any attention. So that was just that where I was. That's where I was thinking we we might source interested folks. That makes sense. Uh, do you uh, need any support to ping the people, the people, John, or uh, could you already go ahead and? Uh go to all of these places and, and, and start pinging folks. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna go after like, all the places where the discussion has happened in the past and just sort of call out everybody that's been interested and ask if, if, if they'd like to get involved. I'm happy to do that. Awesome. Um, there's another thing, uh, there's a trick how we can get more views on tweets, which is posting an image. Um, so we should also post an image. Uh, Ricky, by the way, I have a new laptop and don't have access to the graphical Twitter account anymore, so I will probably oh. uh, annoy you again. Yeah, I'll help uh, you get access to that. Yeah. Yeah. Please. And, uh, um, I need to get set up. That's a, just a quick reminder here. If there's anyone from GraphQL Foundation and Linux Foundation watching, I'd, I I don't know who at GraphQL Foundation is our contact. I'm pretty sure Chris is now because I saw Brian Warner left, but um, yeah. Uh, that's internal. In fact, I won't talk about it because it's an internal security detail, and I won't mention it. Either. Yeah, uh, yeah. Is, but we can we can uh, coordinate that to to get. Yeah, that yeah, we'll coordinate. Uh, perfect. Um, All right. Okay, so, so that's John, um, yeah. Yeah. So that's the that's the first bit about how we begin to get feedback for this, which I think is great. Um, uh, so the next two bits, current design needs and the themeability of the color palette, I think are kind of the same thing. Um, the new design is wonderful. It's great. But I think it's not prepared for, from what I can tell the community wants from GraphQL version two, which is like this extreme um, level of extensibility and flexibility. Um, it, it, we can't give them everything they want for 2.0. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I totally so maybe agree. Yeah, yeah, you know that. Though. John, make the point first. Oh. There needs to be oh, a sorry. Point. No, 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 it's fine. I, I totally agree. There needs to be a, a threshold. There needs to be a bar that set. But um, I think if there is low-hanging fruit in terms of extensibility, the color palette, the themes, that's, that's something that we absolutely should be able to support, especially since um, this thing is run with big companies, small companies, uh, it would be really nice, I think, for a lot of people, for companies to adopt this and to talk about it more often if they were able to just really simply update the, the, the color scheme, right? Like, and just sort of brand it a little bit. Um, so I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to harp on this alpha colors thing. Um, I think it's too much to ask when you want to build your own theme or just sort of change a few of the colors that are running in graphical to ask people to understand um, the, the, what, I, what Julian was explaining to me was a contrast situation, but it, 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 there may just be like a, uh, I may misunderstand something. To me, it's not a contrast situation. It's, it's a depth conversation. It's not about the contrast because as a engineer, as a web engineer, contrast means something very specific to me. I think it's more of a depth thing, right? With the alpha colors that are used, the palette that's currently used, you get this very sort of deep UI. Um, I don't know that we can expect people, 
again, I need to go back to Julian and get confirmation on this, but I don't think it's reasonable to have people have to build out alpha palettes because it's very difficult to test like the actual contrast, the readability, the usability, the accessibility of those colors with alpha palettes. If there's just 16 colors or 20 colors and they're all flat, it's a lot easier to understand um, how that's gonna affect, you know, readability and usability in the future. I could be totally wrong about this. And again, I haven't heard back from Julian, so I, I need to, I, I need to get in touch with him. I've been a little anxious about like reaching out to him directly because Tim, I don't understand much the relationship that you oh, have with him. you can reach out delayed. directly. Yeah, you can reach out directly. That's all good. I don't know how much time he's, you know, he's meant to be giving towards this. And I don't actually also understand how um, complete you guys understand the current design to me uh, or to be. Uh, to me, it's, there's still plenty of work to do there, right? We haven't talked about the font. Like we need, the, 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 the core Figma file can't have that font in it. It's beautiful. I love TT Commons. I've used it in the past, but it can't be, we, we need to change it, right? So there's, mm -hmm. um, so let, let, so that's the, Themeability thing, that's the right. font thing. I'm happy yeah. to do that work in Figma and I've already started doing that work in Figma. It's very chaotic because I'm trying to do, you know, I'm trying to juggle a couple of these things, um, at, a few of these things at the same time, but there's that part. And then the other part, and it's more specific to the actual new UI, the big important thing that we're all trying to test out here. And that's that um, the situation with arguments, if you just go play with the prototype right now, you can see that the arguments thing doesn't really like, doesn't feel very good, right? The show optionals, hides, like using arguments. We have to discuss, we have to find out whether or not users want us to, when you activate a field in the query builder, if we, we want to automatically add required arguments to the query, or if we want to simply in the UI for the query builder, flag that you know with an asterisk that an argument is required and then let the editor bark at a user that they haven't entered a requirement argument for a given query that's that would be my preference because i think the editor does a really good job of yelling at you when when those things don't happen and i think it's a very familiar experience to what you're going to get when you actually are in your editor writing code. So we need to discover, I mean, there's a lot of discovery that we need to do around arguments. There's an inline fragments situation that is not addressed at all in the Figma file. So we need to, um, we need to, we need to figure that out. Um, those are the two big ones in terms of like current design for the, the query builder is just the arguments and how we're going to handle um, inline fragments. Right. One idea that I have for inline fragments is that we pull fragment building out into a plugin, like a sidebar plugin, right? And so you can save those fragments and you toggle those fragments separately to add them into the editor, which would then spread, which would do like the, the ellipses on spread inside the editor. I can show a quick demo if you guys want to see. Actually, I can't show a quick demo because I don't have. You had solved this problem, did it not? Graphical Explorer didn't solve this problem? Because that's what, uh, there's a lot of implementations out there like, uh, uh, you know, for branded custom implementations of graphical with graphical explorers still. So that's the one thing also to think about with that is people are probably going to expect at least a parody of, of what that provides, which I think we're almost there. Yeah. But it's like also defining very like uh, inline variables in line or argu arguments. I think we have all that. But yeah. Yeah, I don't know if one graph did it. it their, their, their UI is an inspiration for this, but it's fundamentally different. It really is fundamentally mm, different. It the interaction does. between the builder yeah. and the editor is a lot different in the design. And I think it's important that it's done that way. It's different than yeah. what, right. what Explorer yeah. does. With what what I mean by parity, though, is like uh, just in terms of what GraphQL features you can use with it. Uh, as, I guess as as, as right. a baseline. So we should yeah. just. I mean, we, that doesn't mean that like they've they had a a lot of time to implement all of that as well. So we don't have to have all of that right away. But it's something to to measure against, I guess. At least. 
in terms of what GraphQL features are. Agreed. I'll say that yeah, Monaco yeah. GraphQL handles fragments really well all by itself. So there isn't a need to get it like put into the query Thank builder you. right away. But I think that I think that I think it's one it's I think it's an opportunity to really improve that experience, right? I, I, I'm, I'm struggling to understand how people are gonna use the query builder over um, just in the editor, because the new editor is just like fast. It's gonna be great. But um, one thing to note sorry, uh, is that OneGraph, uh, Sean at OneGraph told me that they had a lot of customers that were really uh, trying to expand on the analyst experience. So an analysts, they have tools now for visually building SQL queries. So like, that's why he said there was a case for, he was hoping with, with 2.0 back then, this is in like 2020, we were talking about this, that, that the graphical explorer could even like perhaps take over the query editor experience optionally, um, that you could have a mode where you could configure graphical to work that way. Obviously it would not work that way by default, but-, does, but does, that mean the, that, does that mean that the editors would effectively all just be read only? Uh, it would be more like, it, it would be a implementation detail in the background. So in Monaco, it would be like a model that would be written to. Um, and then and then you if you wanted to switch to a, a source tab, so to speak, where you view the GraphQL source, um, then it would print to ASC and load, or well, I guess it would have to print the AST already to to uh, to store the query in the in the in the uh, the uh, Monaco model, but yeah, and, but similar to how we're doing now, basically. Um, yeah. So there's um, I, I think I don't know how much work we want to do in code to explore these ideas. I think there's a lot of time waste that can happen if we do a lot of this in code. Um, we should probably be doing a lot of this in Figma. Um, so we just need more people <laughs> that know how to use Figma to really like explore a lot of these ideas. The core set I believe is already de defined. Um, I'm happy to, to shift I think the prototype is in a great place. It's usable right now. You can plug in your own schema. You can add headers. You can do all that great stuff. Um, I'm happy to jump over into Figma and start crafting um, sort of like a more uh, long-term viable Figma file that everybody can use without, without restrictions. Um, I don't have a estimate of how much time that's going to take, but I, it's got to get done eventually, right? That Figma file needs to kind of get put in a place where um, we can do prototyping there. I don't want to give up on the code prototype because it's equally as important, but we just need to get a solid foundation in for that Figma file. Um, I'm happy to start working on it, uh, you know, as much as I can. Um, I'd love to get, I don't know, Tim, again, I don't know the situation with Julian and like the team that you have. I don't know how much effort you you want your team to put into working on the Figma file. I'm sure there's a community of designers out there that that we can get to rally around this, which would be really interesting. The challenge is that it's so specific to GraphQL and finding designers that know all of this detail and all this nuance with GraphQL is, is difficult. So uh, I don't know where to I don't know where to go from here, but I do know that we need um, to on One thing I want to just add to, to modify what I said earlier, I'm just comparing Graphical Explorer with the prototype and the designs, and uh, <laughs> we're very close. All we need to do is, is be able to... Ricky, what is, what is, when you say Graphical Explorer, what do you mean? That's the name of the tool that OneGraph made called Graphical Explorer. It's implemented in a bunch of places. Yeah, and yeah. It's, it's just, the original just, model just, for this. The, the, the way, so this yeah, is what Graphical. Apollo Studio used, yeah. <laughs> and everything yeah. Yeah. yeah so i'm just looking at uh the spacex example the, the the open source like project it has nothing to do with actual spacex but um they uh the only difference i think and i think maybe this is reflected in the design i can't i just can't find where it is but is that they they have they allow they don't deal with the fragments issue because at least from what i've seen um unless you i think maybe if you add the fragments in the actual query but uh they don't, they have, um, 
you can specify inline variables statically um, with like an editor in the explorer mode. So if there's like a default variable uh, value or I think it's both for default. Wait, no, it's not for, de I've it got, be for default. I've got, it would be um, for variable arguments. I've got, sorry, yeah. I've got yoga up in, a new install of yoga up and running right now that implements one graphs explorer. So I'm going to share this. Yeah. Uh, okay. So in this situation, there's a query called breed. Uh, it returns a union. Yeah. Um, See, of an, you of got it there where it's British. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, so that's an argument. Yeah, that's what that's I mean. It's a variable argument. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that's the I think the only thing we're missing from what I can tell. That's all. I'm what saying. What are we missing? Uh, in terms of if we were thinking of uh, GraphQL uh, parity, uh, like in terms of at, at the level of GraphQL features that you can in like capabilities that you can do in our editor, we could just add that, and then it would have enough parity for people who are used to using Explorer. Uh, can you okay. quickly elaborate what that is? Sorry, didn't the the ability to add inline variable editor argument like variable ah, okay. arguments? Okay, yeah. yeah, that was like an intentional arguments. choice yeah. that yeah. we do not do that. Uh, I can yeah, yeah, that that was an intentional choice that we do not do that um, because uh, we believe that's a rabbit hole. But we can we can get into that later. Uh, it, like it seems like uh, people adding that stuff in the query would be sufficient um, because uh, we as oh, we it's have... just what would unlock the analyst case is all yeah so they can provide okay that. Well, yeah but the other thing though go in the variables editor yeah. right yeah well yeah that's the so thing well then you match up the variables with because as you're if you're thinking again in a query own in a query list composition mode you're you're specifying these. You you could then specify the replacement variables in this. So you just have like maybe a drop down, a selection a selection box of some kind with autocomplete that lets you choose variables that you've already declared to apply to that argument in the query editor. That's all in like okay. in the uh, pathfinder, so to speak. You see I what think I mean? For that, John has something to show. <laughs> oh, well, okay, good. So there already is something for that. So it's kind of like that. So. Um, Early in the design process, Tim um, and everybody, uh, there was there was a, the UI. It's still in the Figma file, but it's it's not really in like sort of the final version that got presented. There's a UI for all the variables just have inputs. And in an earlier version, of, I love it. I think it's fantastic because um, it unlocks so much potential with like like Ricky saying having history of of arguments that you're passing in and being able to really like j j just do lots of interesting things. Um, I had it in the variables editor here. I think uh, if you go to the Discord channel, there's a screenshot of like a past version where you could down here, you could select an editor type, right? You could select an, select an input editor or a code editor. So I've, I've removed that, but let me just do a real quick demo here. So I've selected, this is the, um, the Rick and Morty API that's available uh, here. Um, and I'm just gonna look for a, a, a character um, is a required ID argument, and you can see it's here. This is yelling at me that I haven't selected subfield, so let me just grab a subfield to get that to go away. And then down here in the variables editor, it doesn't automatically fill it out, but I can control space, and it tells me that I need to fill out an ID, right, the variable, and then I can put that in, and then I can I can run that query. So this 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 is great. This is awesome. But this input editor experience, I think, is also really wonderful. Uh, and so I've pulled it out of the core editors here and moved it into like a, a plugin, right? So um, we've got tab one, it's asking for an ID. I can just change this to um, something else and I can get the data that I want. If I have multiple tabs open, um, let me uh, just change the name here. All right, here's tab one, it's got these variables. Tab two, let me add, um, trying to find one of these that has like multiple peers. This one's got a bunch of arguments, right? So here's a whole bunch more. Let me get some subfields. Again, um, if I wanted to just do this all in the variables editor, I can. Wonderful job, Ricky. This is great. This totally works. Uh, but it doesn't understand the type, right? It's going to bark at me if I um, 
this is a string. So if I put in a number, um, oh, validation actually might be broken here for some reason. But basically, this isn't telling me that it's not a string. It's just it's taking a number. If I go here over to the you know easy variables, which is what I've been calling. Wait, it, um, I've got all that. These are just input. That should validate. Ah. Okay. Uh, this is something you, I, I haven't fixed this. It should, I know, but there's a, a, a warning about it not doing something. I don't know. I haven't looked really look into it. But this here, I can switch between my tabs, right, to get my variables at my different tabs. This would be pretty relatively simple to stuff these variables into, right, to save these as some sort of a history in, in, in the situation that. Um, that Ricky was ex was explaining earlier. So I think there's like I'm doing a, I think what I'm doing is I'm doing a lot of work in code um, to just because it's fun. This is really interesting that we should probably be doing Figma to validate a lot of these ideas. So this is just what I wanted to show that um, there is opportunity here for addressing some of that parity. Okay, so let's uh, try things back a bit. We we talked about many things here. Yeah, I just uh, thanks, everyone sharing the thoughts. What I just did, I went through um, the notes here and marked uh, or underlined the points that we should talk about, a bunch of things to talk about. Um, yeah, so that as well. So maybe, yeah, I, I will just give my perspective on this. Um, Anything that is a bit more, let's say, design specific, for example, using alpha colors or not, or obviously not using TT Commons. TT Commons was just uh, because of the design system that we uh, had there, but we won't, we will just use something similar that is open like Inter. Um, that uh, discussion should happen with Julian. It's quite simple. Julian uh, definitely can work on this, and we want. Uh, it, it's always with any project, the last 20% are the tough, the tough part. And it seems like we got a lot of first 80% done with that with graphical. And uh, it would be a travesty if we would not uh, finish the last part here. And of, of course, we want that. Oh, yeah. And I can tell you, John, that definitely Julian, uh, we are happy to finance that and, and let Julian. So we are basically paying for that work with Stellate. We are... Um, Happy to do that. And uh, what I suggest is that it will probably not be very productive to dive into these discussions now. I cannot, I'm not an expert on alpha colors or not, uh, but Julian is. And I suggest that we just uh, write and uh, next week or the week after schedule a call. I think a 30 minute call could be sufficient to just talk about everything design, including how to move the Figma file forward. Um, last time I talked with Julian about this, his preference was that he would like to still own that and not have too many people, if we say like too many cooks, uh, uh, spoil the uh, soup. Not sure if that translates. Mm -hmm. um, too many cooks I, in the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that uh, still for such a fairly small project, uh, having already a few people, few designers from the um, ecosystem and so on would not be helpful. Julian has enough work. Uh, enough time i just need to uh, ping him and uh, he might not have looked into it sometimes need to ping him uh, multiple times he's still busy for sure but uh, we can make that happen in a reasonable amount of time um yeah so uh, anything i think that was like the alpha palettes the fonts were about that also uh, what you said john i really liked of using figma as a prototyping tool instead of uh, directly implementing everything makes total sense I think those would be perfect agenda items. Uh, and uh, I think waiting another month for the next working group is a bit long. Happy to organize something here that we can talk uh, next week or something. Great. Um, yeah. And then we have a bunch of uh, topics that are not related to design, but general functionality topics. As we just said, it's not clear, as you said, uh, not clear how to handle inline fragments. Um, that is, in a sense, also re, uh, re design related because it's UX. Um, so we can also take that topic to next uh, call with Julian and just bring it up. Maybe, uh, John, if you could just um, sketch out uh, options that you see until then, 
for dealing with inline fragments and if the number of options uh, that you can come up with is zero that's also totally fine and we can just brainstorm around that um, yeah I, I i've got i've got some ideas one is already implemented in the, in the prototype um okay, I, I feel like this is really going to be um this is going to divide the community right this is going to be one of those <laughs> things where like, people either people either use fragments or, or they or they don't right or they use fragments and they in graphical currently right they 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 do them in the editor and then they express those fragments inside of their queries um things get a little wonky given like if people are using playground right now maybe graphical is the same way but if you've got like multiple operations inside the editor you get that when you hit play you get that drop down mm -hmm. and you select the operation yeah. so people graphical are using, yeah mm -hmm. so people are using fragments like in in just what like whatever way is available now, right? Because the way that's available now is what's in the editor, which is what you would expect from a traditional yeah. editing experience. Moving that into the UI is a is a is a is a is a different thing. It's a challenge, right? We want to make sure that we cover it. Um, uh, and, and 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 as you said, Tim, I'll 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 explain with some screenshots what I've done currently to try yeah. to do that. And and as far as suggesting alternatives, I think everyone's just gonna. Uh, we're good to, gonna need to hear from the community about what they might like to see uh, yeah. in the editor. Yeah. Um, and also I want to make a quick note here that um, if we have these more tricky topics, then the uh, overall GraphQL working group is always welcoming us to carry these things over there and get their view because they are the GraphQL uh, community in a sense. They are for sure not all of them, but uh, I, I know that they mentioned the fragments topic and that was one, I think Benji brought it up, all oh, surprise, uh, with our idea here with the design fragments would be tricky. So that was known that it would be tricky. We just didn't think about the proper solution. Yet. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's always something we can do. But let's first um, create a proposal internally uh, or maybe whatever options we have. And then we can still present that to a broader audience before we go uh, deeper into implementations there. Um, yeah, I mean, at some point we will need to make decisions, right? on how how to actually do it and that's fine we will never make everyone happy true um yeah. i found adding the external fragments feature satisfied a lot of people's needs uh for both the language server and graphical um and what is the uh, external it, fragments feature can you elaborate um it's a prop for graphical that allows you to specify fragments that are available that get automatically appended to the query on execution that aren't visible in the query editor. This is oh, uh, implemented it. for Gatsby and others who use this. Yeah. Cool. You so, pass it in the level as a prop. You pass in like the actual fragment yes. string. So, so you would be able to. It's a. It can be a string or a array of fragment definition nodes. And so then you would be able to take this and be able to have a pre-supplied uh, set of external fragments that could be potentially insert it in different places for autocomplete yeah. or for whatever purpose. So that's, I know there's several companies using that already uh, that found that to be a suitable way to kind of uh, bring in their own domain logic. It's a little, it was, it was, that was a little controversial though, uh, as you might imagine, because, um, you know, we like uh, fragments to usually in the graphical community we like queries to be fully descri des descriptive it's a it's a client driven domain language so um you 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 want to see everything there you don't want magic fragments uh as gatsby calls them uh but it it helped uh, with that case. So that might be one option to get, you could get it from there. That could be another way of doing it, or we could change that interface in 2.0, just, just a starting point maybe to think about there. Yeah, that's all. Well, and the way that, the, the, way that the, the version two is designed with sort of like the, the pain plugin UI on the left-hand side, like this, that's, an, that's a relatively obvious place to put these sort of magic fragments, right? So that you disconnect from the editor, but you don't disconnect entirely from just being mm -hmm. able to have a UI where you can see them there, that they exist, that it's not, you know, I mean, you could call it out of the editor as well, right? Like you just add a token for a fragment and, you know, there's there's magic that you can redo there to make it work really well, I think. Yeah. And with Monaco, we can do the definition uh, lookup 
for the fragment type. So, uh, thing to. Uh, that's awesome. Like, yeah. But we'll get there. Monaco GraphQL definition support is a thing that's possible. Just putting that out there for if you if you want to do that, uh, open a ticket, hit me up in Discord. I'll show you where to start. <laughs> that's my shout. Awesome. Cool. But I, I think we have some actionable steps here. Uh, I will make sure that we schedule a meeting uh, for uh, including Julian because he is currently the one who came up with the design and we should just talk with him. I think that would be most productive, anything design related. And I think that is also a good opportunity to bring up the challenges around fragments uh, because Julian, as a designer, we sometimes need to Give him, let's say, some time to like ramp up on these topics as he's not a uh, programmer. Uh, great. And then, John, uh, you would go into all the issues. Uh, actually, let's have some action items written down here. So, action items. Uh, so, Tim, great call. John, um, let's say, notify community about new changes. Um, another thing, what, I, what did I wanted to say? What did I want to say? Yeah, please. Ah, yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly what we could do on the on the fragment, fragments and what you already did. Um, I would also, uh, I would say Tim, Ricky, uh, coordinate Twitter. I also wanted to do another tweet. I think uh, on my old laptop, I could actually do a tweet here just after the call uh, with the um, design. Uh, so yeah, and to encourage people, I know that at the GraphQL Conf in Austin, there were some people like the uh, Joey from PayPal who was like, when can I use it? And those people we should go to now and say, hey, you can use it. And by the way, um, yeah, if we literally get no response, we can literally just put a five minute thing into the uh, GraphQL working group. <laughs> so everyone sees it and like, hey, uh, please try yeah, it out if, with your schema. If, if you guys got, um, you know, your presentation was great. I can see how it would have like roused people that were there into wanting to get involved. Everybody wants to use it. Like a lot of, not a lot of people want to help out. Um, yeah. But the, get, like, let's get those folks right. If if people expressed interest in, in using it, like, let's you know, let's yeah. try to put a little pressure on them to get involved with um, re sort of reigniting a lot of the momentum that existed earlier yeah. this year, but it seems yeah. to like fall off since then. Um, PRs are welcome. PRs are welcome <laughs> is unfortunately not enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, true. And reviews. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Sure. Sure. No, I, I will I will look into that a bit more also how we can amp up. Sorry, I have not been very active uh, there last uh, since uh, last call, but I will make sure that's an action item for me. Okay. Anything else on your prototype, John, that you would like to talk about, or do you feel good with this? I feel, I feel great. I want to apologize for taking up so much time there. Um, oh, good. This is important. You have actually worked a lot on this, so uh, that is. Uh, I'm happy that we talk about it, so yeah. Okay, uh, I will put the action items to the bottom, so yeah. Good, so then let's talk about uh, what's happening today. And Thomas, who is um, doing a lot of implementation work, maybe Thomas, you can give us a quick overview where we're at and what's basically left uh, before we can do the big merge and the big graphical tool release, uh, yeah. Sure. Um, the status quo is basically that we said, like we looked into um, doing actual pre-releases with uh, change set, ditch that because that would uh, mean we have to do it for everything in the monorepo, which would like block uh, language server and VS code. Um, so we basically uh, have, uh, again, a um, branch where we collect all the changes that have been reviewed, um, which I keep, uh, rebased regularly uh, on the main branch um, so that uh, we don't run into um, huge merge conflicts uh, in the end. And um, yeah, it's basically me opening um, the, the PRs that are still that, uh, of the changes that I have still like um, 
patched up. There are some things that are still missing. Um, I didn't implement uh, the um, the search yet, I guess, in the in, in the Doc Explorer. Um, so I need to like the uh, the design of the search. So I need to uh, move that over. I mean, functionality will will not change um, for V two until we get the um, the new Doc Explorer. Um, what else is there? Um, Oh wait, so I could, V2, I thought, so I thought the new Doc Explorer is coming in V2. You said it's going to come in V3 though? I think uh -huh. with Doc Explorer, it means, it means the docs. I think we need to clarify terms. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, we, we will uh, keep the doc sidebar as it is for now and just like move it over to match the general uh, design theme, but not change functionality. Right. Thomas, does that mean that you're going to take the, in the Figma file, there's a UI for the search that's currently in place for like the, in Figma file, what I've been calling Pathfinder. You're gonna take that and you're gonna use that for the traditional or familiar Docs Explorer view that you've got in the, that's going out for, for V2. Um, there is a uh, also intermediate, a, a design for like, uh, it's called I think intermediate doc. Docs um, where um, there's all there's also a little design for the search. I, I'm not sure right now how this if this differs from the um, search in the uh, new doc explorer um, or not. Um, Is this in but it should be. It's somewhere like uh, on, on the bottom, I think. Um, so sort of like uh, hard to find. I, I would need to look it up now. I don't search. Uh, no, I'll, I'll find it. I, yeah, I can find it. I just didn't know where, where the source was. Um, I guess apart from that, um, gra regarding uh, graphical React, um, I'd keep this uh, as um, like still version zero dot whatever, um, as it's probably not going to be really stable when we release uh, graphical v2. I think there will be like quite some, uh, or that there might be quite some changes that we would like to do so I'd not push that to a version one. Also we have like um, going ahead of it, we, we don't have any docs or whatever yet for it. So it's probably yeah. impossible to use without uh, knowing the, the source code by heart. I have some um, ideas about that, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can talk about that in the next, uh, in the next thing. And I think that's, um, Pretty much, uh, it's like uh, for sure there will be some some nits that uh, that we need to do uh, to really finish it off in the end before we can uh, do the release. But um, that's still in the uh, unknown area, at least from my side. Um, but I don't expect anything that uh, would take up uh, a week to to fix. So it's probably going to be lots of smaller quick fix issues. Okay, so it sounds like within the next like two weeks or something, or I don't know how long it takes for you to implement the search, uh, or whatever is missing, then we should be able to get like a release candidate out or something. Uh, so uh, did I correctly understand that we kind of in the current setup with change set, we kind of would need to decide that we move the whole repo and all over to release candidate mode? How is that? Yes. Exactly. Okay. So if we would start uh, using change set to um, publish uh, like alpha or beta or whatever versions we want to call them, then this would also take effect for the VS Code extension, for example, and it would basically block oh. us from publishing regular version updates for these packages. I just so forgot yeah. it's not doing that yet, is it? It's not publishing the, the alpha releases from that feature branch yet, right? Uh, no, um, and I don't think we okay. can. Like we get oh. uh, the, the canary versions, um, but we can't do the change set uh, pre-release mode because this would like uh, mean we have to merge an actual release PR and then that sort of would affect all packages in the repo. Uh, actually, I, I think this is actually possible. I think I think it's it's possible that we could publish from the feature branch similarly to how we do with canaries, but all we have to do is slightly change the, the GitHub workflow to work for feature branch. So it could say, oh, if it's a feature branch, 
then you can publish alphas. And as long as we make sure to overwrite it so that it's appending alpha instead of canary, and in fact, with the way it is now, I, I wouldn't conflict with anything. As long yeah. as we, when we merge it, we go out of pre-release. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that I would, fine. you wouldn't need pre-release at all if we have a custom GitHub action that just uh, publishes alpha versions. Um, yeah. That, that should work as I well, like, I guess. I didn't. Uh, Jotan, uh, Jotan or someone from the guild could probably know how to set that up for us. They're really good at it. They set yeah. up the, the canary stuff. Yeah. I mean, the question is how much value will it bring us? I mean, it really only makes sense when we uh, like when I merged all the changes in, and it's like really usable to have um, beta versions that people could try out. Yeah, um, and then we are in the same spot where we would uh, first need to like find people who really tried out to like yeah. get actually. It'll be feedback. super useful because yeah, then you'll get feedback on like bundlers and all kinds of different like ways people are using it. People will be like an SSR, da da da. You know, as soon as you get the releases out there. But yeah, I yeah, think people will be. Yeah, we need the people who would who would do it, and I'm yeah, not sure exactly. how how fast and how many people we can get if it's already difficult for like uh, right. uh, in, the, in the prototype. We'll probably in exactly. a similar spot here. Yeah, you and wouldn't you want, want like you're saying you know, it. Yeah. I was going to say, you wouldn't want that repo sitting in that state for two months. Yeah, right? exactly. Mm -mm. Yeah. Mm -mm. I'd like to then merge the, the branch where we collect all the changes right. uh, rather sooner than later. Yeah. You, you could basically mm -hmm. use the beta, the beta release as like a, a integration testing, of basically saying, OK, it's pretty much ready. Like maybe release candidate is even a better fit for that and say, can you people try it and make sure it works and like we can work out some bugs so we don't have to do a bunch of patch releases after we do a, a new major version release. But uh, yeah, or, but yeah, I think that, that that's overall, yeah, we don't need to do this until very, at the very end stage. Yeah. Another possibility could be to um, like actively start uh, or trying to upgrade graphical in other open source packages like uh, yoga or whatever, um, and see if that works out. Yep, true. Yep. You can collaborate with some people there. Uh, just to clarify, we have a bunch of different disk tags on NPM. I just checked. We have alpha, latest, canary, next. Uh, which one would we want to use here? Do we use canary for that? I think we'd want to use alpha. Canary is usually we... just for any pull request with a change okay. set. Yep. OK. Or maybe we would still call it alpha for now and wait till we're ready to use RC to be more explicit that this is like pretty much ready, literally a candidate for you to try and make sure it works. Yeah. OK. Makes sense. But yeah, whatever you want to use, we, we can figure it out. And also, if, if we want to do it like at the very end, just like a last, like a couple, we can even just do it manually, where I just pull the branch down and, and push it or show you how to do it. and you would be able to use change yep. set release yeah. to just That's cut true. it. I'm just missing uh, access to npm repo uh, to the npm. Oh. So, so I could also do it. Uh, but, I have um, to figure out how to do that. I asked around about that about a month ago, and hopefully I'll hear back soon. Uh, I, I'm not able to grant access. I, I yeah. only have access. Yeah. yeah. Mm, no worries. Okay. okay. Otherwise, I would have given it. Not, not urgent, I think that, I think. Uh, uh, I, I'm not going to say who, who can me. help with that for safety. For no worries. Um, I think we first uh, have, to, uh, have to get all the changes in any way before we can start thinking about uh, publishing anything. And that will probably still take a week or two. Rather, two. That's it. OK. But then it sounds like the finish line is in sight. That's exciting. Uh, a lot of good work um, and also yeah, from everyone, also a lot of work from Thomas here, um, actual implementation work. Um, great. So it sounds like we're in a pretty good state. So we say we would like to get it out on alpha, even if it's a one time manual release that then can be spread across the committee. And again, we could do a, a call out to the community, Twitter, Discord, etc., and say, look, that's the alpha. Please use it. We soon want to go uh, and and put it into. I mean, would we even use beta then if once we have alpha? 
Well, how would we want to do that? that I, I that like release candidates. Um, then yeah. it's pretty clear, like this is the next version. Um, expect like minor breaking changes to come in, but it's pretty much mm -hmm. stable for the most part. I feel like we could do even one beta where we're saying where it's out. Oh, it's leaving alpha. Now we're in beta. We'll do one beta release, fix all the bugs that come back, and then call that RC. Maybe. We'll see. Whatever we decide, it, it's a bridge we'll cross when we get there. And just a um, quick question in RC, would that land on latest, or how is that usually with RCs? Oh, uh, RC would still be a pre release tag. It's like the last, last, yeah. last. Release. Yeah. Okay, so we would have an RC. How, how do they do that with other? It, it, it communicates basically. We expect this to to work well enough that it shouldn't be buggy. It's no longer a beta, yeah. but we just want to make sure like it works for you. Yeah. So I just checked React, for example, has an actual RC tag, uh, which is also an option, right? We could introduce that, um, but it seems like alpha beta. RC is a bit overkill. Uh, but we, uh, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> Probably. Uh, Me overcomplicating things? No way. <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't need to make the decision now. I think after all, we want to just get it into people's hands. And basically the same here. We will have a call to action for community, same as with John's uh, prototype or POC. Uh, is it that, would that make sense that we call your work on a POC instead of a prototype? I don't know. I'm not oh. sure if that even helps. <laughs> Every, everybody's going to have their own opinion, right? Like everyone's history is going to inform whether it's called a prototype or, or a proof of concept. I think, I mean, technically, literally, it's closer to a prototype than it is a proof of concept because we're not radically changing the core experience, right? The core experience, the editor is staying the same. There's just this one piece, the query builder, that's the focus of the prototype. I explain this all in the new readme that I'm written for that I've written for my repository. It's it's really just that query builder and, and its interaction with the classic editor, familiar traditional <laughs> editor experience that we that we're that we're testing out here. So I, I think it's interchangeable. I okay on the list of things to gripe about, that's at the, the very bottom. I think what we what could help um, would be uh, I think it's in the preview URL for example there's still v2 in there um, just to take the v2 out to make I the distinction between uh, what's the next major version and yeah. what's this thing that you're working on to make this you a, a bit more distinct. That's a wonderful point. Yeah, I'll change that right now. Awesome. And I then I one, hope. Oh yeah, please, Thomas. One thing that just came to my mind: we, uh, some somebody, probably me, needs to write up a, a migration guide um, to make yeah. sure that uh, um, all the customizations that are available in V1 uh, can be moved over to V2, and people know about how to do it. That's a great point. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah. There there shouldn't be a whole lot, but yeah, it'll be fun to write that and say like now. You can do theming with CSS variables, you know, or, yeah. you know. I think there's yeah. more, a bit more things like um, you, we don't have class components anymore, so you can't pass a ref and uh, access like methods. You need to like uh, mm. use mm -hmm. some uh, some of our hooks to, to access the um, state that's now in uh, providers and stuff like that. Um, I've had some ideas for prop for props changes too, while we get a chance at a breaking version. For example, we have like, a lot of these Boolean toggle like flags, it's a pattern I continued for a while, but it's just it's just messy. And there's a lot of those I think could be like enum type values or like uh, represented in a, new, a different type of configuration. So like like head editor, editor toggled, head editor, header editor visible by default, like these kinds of like laborious yeah. booleans that we could maybe imagine in a different props, you know. So if you have any ideas for that, I'm a, I'm happy to break props that are uh, annoying or confused like see yeah like... i had some i had some things in mind when i looked at it and uh, <laughs> but th th this are like the, the things that i went with like the the nits in the end to like uh, finish uh, the next major version really uh, off so um yeah I, just little nits you don't have to yeah. do anything major just ideas if there's something that's like it seems relatively simple to make this prop make more sense or a few props or whatever like 
yeah feel free so don't worry about that it's a good good uh, good chance to break some changes do some breaking changes here yeah ideally breaking Keep changes sense. that are like that makes more sense like th those yeah. are the ones we want to make for this yeah that's a good 2.0 okay. move yeah okay awesome anything else on this seems like we have a good uh path now which was the point path to graphical tool by the way in uh graphql Wroclaw in poland uh, a uh, attendee of the conference was very or a meetup was very let's say eager to get a Monaco release as well or let's say a new graphical which uses Monaco uh, and I was saying yeah easy we're getting the new design out that's a lot of work and then step by step but uh, the community is already excited about that as well yeah there's also a person uh, Thomas and, and Ricky on the on that um that issue, that blind developer. This is such a wonderful opportunity to get somebody who requires accessibility to the extreme involved early in the process. Um, it was really nice to hear that Monaco just kind of worked for them, right? It's just oh, wonderful mm -hmm. validation of the direction. I just thought that was great. Yeah. Yeah, we have that. We've had that validation before with the early Monaco demos. A couple of years ago, we had the same thing where a, a user came into Discord and or a GitHub issue and asked, like, "Oh, I can't use this." And I just shared, uh, "What? What, what about this Monaco GraphQL demo?" And they said, "Oh my gosh, this is so much better." Yeah, and as we know, VS Code accessibility is premium, and they they really put a lot into that. But I also want to give a shout out to Codemere 6 and the maintainer of Codemere, whoever it is, who I was rude to once. I apologize. Uh, uh, he's doing a great job. And well, the Codemere community is doing a great job of, of taking accessibility into account for 6. But we'll, we'll get there when we get there. It's uh, like, it, it, I think it can be our main target for 3.0 is a fully accessible graphical. I think that's a, a, a yeah. Do we, what do we think? We, we, we maybe not promise it, but let's let's really try. Yeah, yeah. I think. I think it's oh, kind no, of my Monica. my fault that we don't have the first. Monaco, yeah, no. Monaco gets yeah. Monaco gets so close, right? If the rest of it is just React components, it's just a matter of figuring out. It's just matter of matter of labeling everything and yes, ensuring that right. we're tab indexing correctly and we're we're capturing focus and, and, and doing all that, which is not a small amount of work, but it's it's a known quantity. Um, yeah, yeah. In, to in be clear, I, I yeah I do see that it's a lot more than just Monaco is required to make graphical accessible, but but um, you can't we can't really make. With with Code Mirror Five, even if we do everything we can to make the rest of the the Chrome accessible, Code Mirror Five won't be just just for I'm again speaking to the audience again. Sorry, <laughs> but yeah, I, I apologize to cut you off. Um, go ahead. No, no worries. Yeah, that's great. I mean, uh, it seems like with Monaco, a lot uh, would be uh, covered out of the box, and we wouldn't need to worry about it. That's great. Uh, awesome. So then let's wrap that point up and uh, go to the last point that we have today here. Let's see if can we I, will indeed. Oh, yeah, please. John. One, one thing really quick. Um, Thomas, I haven't done any work on the current repository, but I'm available if you need help as things are beginning to ramp up towards release and you can chunk small bits of work up that 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 you can pass off to me without needing to have the full history. I'm happy to to, to jump in and help out. I just, right now, I have, would have no idea where to start, but I want to make sure that you know that I, I can be available if there's work that you can slice out that makes sense. I mean, it would already be awesome to get reviews on my PR, so I definitely invite you to them. Okay. I apologize. Yeah. No I, I wish I could do, I as I get into the other things I can focus on because you're doing all this great work, Thomas, I, I, I haven't no. like, like the quality no. of my, the deeper I get into the LSP server, the worse my graphical yeah, PR sure. reviews get. So any, yeah, the more help the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's like yeah. A, trying to learn a different language, you know. Like, 
I'm happy to happy to look at them, and it's probably a, a, the best way for me to get familiar with um, the existing code base, which yeah. I haven't done. I mean, so. we'll uh, definitely have some some things to fix then. Uh, like I have a lot of things still uh, piled up that I just need to like pick out into uh, reviewable PRs. Um, but then in the end, I think we'll have for sure some things uh, that we can um, fix in parallel where we can split things up. I have a question. I have a question. Is there time for a question? Yes. It has to do with graphical. Uh, do we plan on having no CSS files at one point and using CSS and JS entirely? What's the plan there? Just curious. Oh, just a little uh, question. Tiny question. That's a very small, quick question. <laughs> I think for me, I'd keep uh, CSS files around for version two, um, just because it's uh, the most straightforward way um, to get things done. Um, also for people who want to contribute, it's, uh, they don't have to learn any CSS and JS framework that we uh, decide to use. Um, but like I'm open for uh, discussing this uh, further in the future. Okay. I mean, That's great. since we since we now got theming. Um, the like the use case of overriding classes is uh, should officially be discouraged um, uh, not to do. Um, so this would also enable us to switch things out uh, without having to do breaking changes. So that's, that's one thing that uh, that I'd uh, include in the um, like migration guide, release notes, whatever for version two. That um, if people want to change the appearance, then theming is the way to go. Um, and not over or like overriding class names. Can still do it if you want, but uh, we won't uh, do or we won't consider um, changes to class names as breaking anymore. Yeah, there, there should be an easily understandable, documented way for theming. Like there, there should be almost zero ambiguity for how to change uh, the branding yeah. icon or the color of this thing or the color of that thing. It's 2022. This should be. This is absolutely low hanging. Exactly. I do want I do want to say that while CSS and JS can help us here immensely, in the React world, this is changing. This seems like it's changing every week, right? The core React team is now uh, pushing back pretty heavily on CSS and JavaScript solutions. Um, it doesn't look pretty for um, anyone who's using a library and wants to, you know, it's not happening now. Yeah, there's a, it's not happening right now, but it's going to happen soon, right? This whole vanilla JS streaming CSS react is the react team isn't super into it. Um, so it, it, it's good that we're not making this decision right now uh, about whether to, to move away from CSS and into to CSS and JS, but it's something to keep our eye on and to, you know, front end engineers keep their eyes on these things anyway. So um, it's going to have a, yeah. a big impact on this decision in the future. Agreed. And let's just make really exciting, clever use of CSS variables, even maybe for like spacing and typography as well as color. So we, yeah, okay, great. Yeah, it looks, I, I'm sorry. That's how ter you can tell how little <laughs> I've reviewed by, I'm just like, let's make sure to do this. And you're like, I did that already. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, because we're doing that, we unlock all those features so that they don't, like you're saying, they don't have to worry about class names right. anymore. Yeah. Great. Right. Okay, uh, incredibly uh, short discussion on such a big topic. It is in incredible how much we are aligned. Uh, great, then let's use uh, uh, the rest of the time we have here to talk about um, uh, docs, the doc site. This is a very fast meeting. Uh, yeah, so. Doc site. Um, yeah, I'm just looking into a few options. I plan on introducing a doc site for other parts of the ecosystem, especially because uh, right now, obviously, with graphical things are in flux. Uh, maybe we could just do just like kind of move what's there into a static 1.0 doc site that we can eventually like add to, so that we have like the two point. I don't know how we'll do the versioning of docs. Uh, but I see like uh, DocuSource, other tools have 
have some stuff for this. Uh, I'm using like the guild and some other open source folks as like a model of how they do doc sites and whatnot um, with, you know, type doc to markdown and, you know, uh, you know, like the kind of structure and things and getting inspiration from them and others. So um, I'd like to have, uh, especially for, you know, it's been a, a long time missing thing. Like you notice just the readme's just keep getting longer and longer. Uh, with graphical toolkit, I, I finally daringly broke away and said, you know what, there will be a markdown that's not a readme <laughs> uh, with docs in it. And and I think we can start uh, uh, doing more. Yeah, as you can tell, I've like kind of tried to weirdly stick with very early conventions in the merged borrowed repos that like the resources folder and all this stuff. Uh, that are all holdovers from the old Facebook repo. And just please just feel free to just introduce any new structures and conventions and whatever, anything that you ever want to do, just just for the record, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, for the doc site, yeah, I think it would help users a lot to have just a simple doc site uh, that, that, um, that we can use. And uh, Brian Warner, formerly of um, uh, GraphQL Foundation, Linux Foundation, I think he, moved on to an, another path, but he had uh, set up a graphical.dev domain for us, um, I think is what it was. And uh, we have other options as well. We could do like graphical.graphql.org. There's a lot of options for that. Um, I feel like the domain is one of the last things you figure out with something like this, but um, like, uh, yeah, we'll figure out something, but something other than graphical test.netlify.app, which is what we currently use, because someone has reserved the graphical namespace on Netlify, and I haven't bothered to just like email Netlify, which because it's probably a totally deactivated site from like 10 years ago. But yeah. Um, somebody just yeah. waiting. <laughs> Someone's got it camped out. Someone took the, gra the GraphQL namespace and Docker Hub. And if you're watching, I'm coming for you. No, I'm just <laughs> so, Ricky, how do you how do you see um, <clears throat> how do you see maintenance of these doc sites going forward? Right? How do you see that maintenance fitting into everyday chaos? development? Yeah, I mean, it's just already yeah. sort of chaotic, right? Um, I understand right. that the doc site would help it would potentially help it get less chaotic because instead of editing readme's for editing something else. Um, mm -hmm. But I also, I love what the guild does is wonderful, but I use their tools a lot. I use a lot of their ecosystem pretty frequently. And, and it's hard to keep docs up to date. Yeah. Their docs are not up to date. Like, I mean, there's holes in them, right? Like it's, it's, it's hard yeah. to do it. So um, interesting. One thing I'll note is that the, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I didn't mean to go ahead. I'm just going to say introducing, um, a doc site is it, it would just be we have to be careful that it doesn't yeah make it worse <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know how else to say it you know like it doesn't make the I, chaos crazy. if it <laughs> makes any if it makes uh yeah i think the way i see it is it would be basically taking what we have in mark and readme's already and putting it in into a doc site format um and then leaning as much as possible on type doc, right? We shouldn't be, that's why I eventually moved in the graphical readme, if you notice, I eventually just linked to the type doc for the props. Um, and what I'd rather do is link to the type doc in Markdown generated as part of a DocuSource site that looks real nice, but then has all the props mapped out, but it's all described in TypeScript. And what I wanna do is describe as much as possible, obviously for API and TypeScript, and then you can use these these like plugins for DocuSource and these other doc site generators, uh, Gatsby does this too, where you can link to specific types um, in the type doc. So like in like a kind of magic-ish way from your regular readme um, um, or from your markdown or, or uh, MDX. Uh, so yeah, and I think that would be good. And we could just add a couple of quick examples and whatnot for people to look at. And what I'd like to do is just have like a, an examples gallery in line with MDX, you know, 
uh, that I that I can look at when doing deploys too. You know, so we can look at our deploy preview, look at the doc site, look at the examples gallery that runs through different cases of different configurations of props, and then you can kind of do a quick scan for a manual uh, regression check. You know, beyond so like could, the end-to-end -end suite. You know, you're talking about just for the IDE, or just for graphical, right? Not the associated packages. Well, I'm just saying it's an example, but yeah, for the associated packages, we need it as well. Yeah. So there would be different sections of it. I'm trying to figure out whether they would each have like their own, like, I think we could do a separate one for GraphQL LSP and the VS code at one, and then another one just for graphical, maybe at separate domains and still deploy it from the same repo. And yeah, that would probably make the most sense because the cognitive overload otherwise would be like, I'm trying to read about graphical and there's something about a server called LSP. What's that? You know, uh, yeah, I, I was thinking that given the, you know, given the sort of more, uh, I don't want to sound like an asshole, but given like the sort of the more modern approach to designing the, the, the new version of graphical, like that's designed first, that has, you know, some kind of a design library that's powering it. It, it lends itself really well to what you think of as like a classic kind of like design system library. Like go look at what Vercel does for their c component library, right? Where you can explain, it's not storybook. It's a lot simpler than storybook. It explains the props that you need. You can have examples, you can have running code bits, all that stuff. It's really well supported just by the process that is being followed right now where we're starting in Figma and moving over to to code, we just, I think we just, I, I always saw it being more simple to document how to use graphical, what the prop types are, what the shape of the data that can go in is, what the options are. Like it just seems a lot easier given the, the process than it, like, than in the past, you know? So maybe, so maybe it's different, right? Maybe graphical itself it can live in the same doc world, but just the representation is a little bit different. Like it's less, again, I don't want to sound like an asshole, but like it's less dry, it's more interactive, right? Like the graphical could, the graphical documentation could be more interactive, like change this prop, here's what it's yeah. gonna look like. Exactly, well, because we'll be using MDX, we would have that level of flexibility. So we, you could just define an inline component then and render it inside a markdown page and and that, that has that toggle, you know, like a, right. a kind of a, a playground where you could do like the, uh, I, I call that like the old, the old jQuery gallery, uh, yeah. the old jQuery plugin gallery where you have, where you can toggle the features <laughs> and look at, the funny thing is uh, as advanced as we are now, there's like some basic service level concepts that applied to the old monolithic jQuery plugins that kind of apply to graphical because it's like a whole end user interface that you're rendering with one kind of component. Uh, so, and I don't know. Anyways, this is just a funny joke. I don't know, certain things. But, By the way, uh, demos. Oh, please, Ricky. Yeah, uh, I, all I was gonna say is, so finding from this is I will treat the LSP server and maybe also CodeMirror GraphQL, Monaco GraphQL API docs as maybe a separate thing than the graphical docs and just be like, here's the, LS, the editor ecosystem. These are the more advanced docs or docs that are for IDE users. And then a separate site would be for graphical and the graphical S SDK and things under the at graphical namespace. Yeah, so cool. That's perfect. Uh, and by the way, we could also, or in terms of domains, just use GitHub pages, right? Would also be fine. Uh, which oh yeah, gives us I a mean, pretty nice URL. Yeah. yeah, we already have all the Net Netlify stuff set up for GraphQL Foundation though. Oh, okay. I already have access to all also of it. Works. Yeah, so yeah. might as well, yeah. And then we can have demo schemas with serverless functions, with the Netlify mm -hmm. functions, all kinds of cool stuff. Except the, uh, yeah, but yeah, cool. Yeah. There's one thing I want to show you, you probably don't know about this because this is still quite new, but uh, Johannes uh, Chickling actually is building a tool called Paka that auto generates uh, a pretty nice docs page based on uh, TypeScript types. And this is pretty nice, actually. It does not contain what we talked about in terms of uh, like examples for components, but if you have a more like uh, TypeScript API, this is already pretty strong. There's nothing to do for us here. So if we say that graphical React, we want uh, docs for that. The good thing is that it supports the um, inline uh, Markdown docs, uh, like comments that we can do. 
And with that, I th yeah, there were even some examples where we already were rendering. Yeah, this is um, cool. Text. They, so they, this is uh, nothing official. I need to ask Johannes if we can even use okay. this. Uh, he's still working on it. But okay. Yeah. The, the thing is, it's completely auto-generated and there's nothing because we talked about, okay, how to keep things up to date. Uh, it, we If we stick to less documentation, but having all the documentation based on code, this could be a pretty good starting point. Uh, I, I will ask Johannes uh, how much uh, he's comfortable with us using this. It's not yet, doesn't even have a landing page. Uh, yeah. Can you add custom uh, like learning resources on the tab on the top left? Yeah, he has like a learning the, tab there, but there's some, also the like, readme. Yeah. Probably with like more markdown files. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, as a quick thing, I will I will talk to Johannes about that. Uh, might be a good start at least for the uh, graphical React package to have something. Um, uh, okay, cool. Then, if we don't have anything else, we can leave it at that for this time. Um, and I will follow up with the next call then with Julian, so we can actually talk about design, John. And um, yeah, awesome. Anything else? Nope. I mean, for sure, there are a million topics we could talk about, but it seems like we talked about the most important ones. Awesome. Okay, then I would say let's leave it at that. Thanks everyone for coming. And we have a bu bunch of action items we can check in on next time, actually. Uh, okay. And that's it. Sounds okay. good. Right. Awesome work, everyone. Yeah. Likewise. Have a nice day. Okay. See, you. See you. Ciao. Bye.